So in the previous flowchart and video, I left you off with this idea of comparing frog and sea urchin gastrulation. In this next video, which will entitle chick gastrulation, what I want to basically state is that now that we understand that the characteristic highlights of both frog and sea urchin gastrulation are pretty much the same except for the events that lead up to those highlights, um, this is going to be much the same in all organisms that are pretty much uh, higher order organisms and chicks are no exception to that. They just have a different sort of uh, outcome in their events because of a specific uh, constraint that we'll see. And this is going to be shown in figure 47.11 as we go through this. So we're not going to look at the characteristic highlights and then look at the sequence of events. This is going to be much more of an overview and a, a much more uh, summative look at chick gastrulation since we already have a good grasp of what it means to undergo gastrulation with those characteristic highlights that we've seen several times over now. So the key point of chick gastrulation to keep in mind when we look at the events is that there's going to be lots of yolk. These are meroblastic organisms. As we saw in the previous lecture, this causes a different cleavage results and different events during cleavage um, because of the large amount of yolk presence within this developing embryo. Because there's a lot of yolk presence, we have to state that this simple gastrulation, aka the gastrulation that we saw in sea urchins, that we saw in frogs, that's considered simple gastrulation. Those events can't happen at the vegetal hemisphere in a chick uh, embryo, at vegetal hemi. Now, this is because, and I should say that these can't happen, that's the word that we're missing here. It can't happen at the vegetal hemisphere. And this is because the vegetal hemisphere, if you remember, is the one that possesses and has the presence of lots of yolk. So let's see the consequences of that during the sequence of events that are going to cause gastrulation in a chick blastula. So let's look at the beginning of gastrulation here. So beginning of gastrulation. What happens? Here, what you have to understand about chicks, because they're going to have this large amount of yolk on the vegetal hemisphere, they're going to have a very characteristic two-layered embryo. This is the major characteristic that chick embryos have. This two-layered embryo will consist of something called a hypoblast, and will also consist of the other layer called the epiblast. We're going to look at the um, epiblast first. This is going to be the upper layer of this chick embryo. And as the upper layer, the epiblast contains very important cells. It contains the cells that form something known as embryo proper, that form the embryo, embryo proper. So this is a new term that you should understand and know. The embryo proper, whenever you're talking about development, is the structure or the group of cells that's going to develop into the actual embryo, into the actual organism that is born. So this is the part that directly develops into the chick, therefore because it contains the embryo proper cells. That's why it's called the embryo proper region. That's the region that is known as the epiblast, the upper layer. And right below that, thus hypo, the name below, that lower layer is going to be the hypoblast. So right below the epiblast layer is a lower layer termed the hypoblast. Here, this layer is actually the layer that's directly on top of the yolk mass. Directly on top of the yolk mass. So basically we have in this developing egg, uh, in this developing uh, chick, we have the yolk, we have the hypoblast, and on top of the hypoblast is the epiblast. And this structure being on top, directly on top of the yolk is going to be an area of importance when we talk later about the consequences and sequence of events that we see. Overall, what I want you to remember is that both the hypoblast and the epiblast are on top of the large yolk mass. So both are on top of the yolk mass where there's lots of yolk 
And so what we're going to notice is that the hypoblast will have different outcomes because it's closer to the yolk, and the epiblast will have different outcomes because it's further away from the yolk. So we have yolk mass, then on top of that is the hypoblast, and on top of that is the epiblast. That's the sort of context of gastrulation that we're seeing here. So let's look at some specific events that occur now that we have a good understanding of structure and where we are in the chick gastrulation process. So some specific events to keep in mind. What we're going to first notice is that during gastrulation, some epiblast cells, so some of these cells on the top layer, are going to move. That's called cell migration, right? This is a ca common characteristic that we see. They're going to move toward the midline of the layer. Midline of layer. They're basically going to go towards the middle of this overall structure. And as they do this, they will detach and then subsequently move inwards towards the yolk, actually. So they're going further and further inwards uh, in this overall structure. They're basically going downwards from the top of the epiblast towards the yolk. So now, what is this going to do? Why is this movement towards this yolk? I should say, why is this migration towards the yolk happening? This is in an attempt to form a new structure that you should know called the primitive streak. This forms the primitive streak. And if you remember, the epiblast cells are those cells that contain, or this is the area, come from the area that contains the cells that eventually becomes the actual chick that is born, the embryo proper cells, therefore. So the primitive streak will have some sort of influence in that because the primitive streak is going to be what is considered the thickened area of this developing embryo, okay, as a result of this process. So now, take a look at this primitive streak. We've developed it. It's thickened area. That's all we've said. Now what I want to do is summarize the fate of this as we've, now we've developed or understood how it happens, how it's made, the primitive streak. What is the purpose of it? So now what I want to entitle this next part is Primitive streak fate. What is the purpose? What does it result in? So two major results are the following. Some cells that have moved and formed this primitive streak are going to actually go downwards, even closer towards the yolk. Some cells, I should say, move downwards toward um, yolk mass. So they're trying to get even closer. And as they're moving downwards towards the yolk mass, they actually are going to push the hypoblast cells that are very already very close to the yolk mass aside. They push these hypoblast cells to the, uh, to the side, and you'll see this nicely in the figure that I mentioned before. And when they're pushing them to the side, this is overall going to form the endoderm. And that's a very important consequence here because we're trying to create three germ layers as a part of gastrulation. We've, com we've commented and explicitly now mentioned one of those three germ layers. The other germ layer that I want to mention is as a result of the primitive streak as well, but it's a different fate. So we had some cells move downward toward the yolk mass. They push these hypoblast cells aside. Those that are pushed aside essentially are going to, um, the cells that are moving downwards, I should say, are going to form this endoderm. Now, other cells of this primitive streak, let's say, other cells are going to migrate laterally. Instead of downwards, they're going to migrate from to the sides. When they migrate laterally, these are the cells that will eventually form the mesoderm. So now we've covered our second germ layer of interest and of importance. And then also what we just want to mention now is the fate of the hypoblast cells, those cells that we've sort of ignored from this point on, uh, from the, before this point. And so now let's just mention what these cells are going to turn into. So we have these hypoblast cells. We said that was the lower layer. So we have an epiblast, we have a hypoblast, and then we have a yolk mass. See, they're very close to the yolk mass. So let's see what happens to them. The hypoblast cells are going to contribute to uh, the sac that will be surrounding the yolk. So there's going to be a specific structure that surrounds the yolk when the actual egg is formed, let's say, because chicks hatch out of eggs, and that sac will be a result of the hypoblast cells of this chick uh, developing gastrula. 
And also, some of these hypoblast cells will contribute to something else. They will contribute to the connection, the connection between the yolk plus the embryo. We've been mentioning the yolk many times over, but now what we're stating is that there's going to be an explicit connection between yolk and embryo. Yolk is a super important structure of the chick overall development because it provides the nutrients very much necessary for the chick to successfully develop. But a caveat, a something I want or something I want you to keep in mind here is that we're only developing a connection here. The hypoblast cells do not explicitly ever form the embryo itself. So write this down as not the embryo itself. Okay, just the connection between yolk and embryo. Okay, so the embryo is exclusively going to be formed from the epiblast embryo proper cells. Nothing from the hypoblast will directly involve itself in embryonic or the embryo production of the embryo that will eventually be the fetus and then it will eventually be born as the chick. That covers our look at chick gastrulation. Notice some of the differences, especially as a result of this yolk mass being interfering. Um, and now we have these different layers to keep in mind. Primitive streak has been mentioned. Um, these are going to now be things that we work off of now that we've finally gotten to the point of looking at exclusively now human gastrulation.